Hey everyone, my name is Jack. Welcome back to the channel. I cover a variety of topics as they relate to real estate, investing, the markets, and pretty much everything as it has to do with personal finance. So if you like that sort of content, be sure to have a look around the channel. And if you like what you see, be sure to subscribe. But today I want to do another episode of my economic series where I take a popular policy and see what the economics of it look like in explaining why it does or does not work. Last time I did rent control, but this episode I want to do a rather similar concept, only this time with the minimum wage. Because there's always at least one group advocating for a higher minimum wage or politicians dangling it in front of people, promising a higher minimum wage for everyone else. But unfortunately, the economics of the situation really don't support it very much as a policy, as I'll get to when I jump over to my computer in a second. But if you guys like this sort of video going into the technicalities and, and the economic theory behind particular policies, definitely leave a like and definitely let me know in the comments below whether I should continue to do more of these episodes and definitely let me know if there's a specific policy you want to see me break down. Of course, if you think I'm misinterpreting something, definitely let me know in the comments below and we can have a civil discourse about it. But anyways, let's jump over to my computer. All right, welcome to my computer once again. So this is the famous supply and demand graph because labor is a market. We can see wages here plotted on the left and quantity demanded of labor on the bottom here on the x-axis. So demand here would be the amount of labor demanded by employers. So people who need labor and people who hire people. That's the demand curve here. So as you can see here, as wages go down, we'd expect employers to employ more people or somehow get more labor on their side because they can get it for cheaper. So that makes sense. Now, the supply side here would be the supply of labor, or in other words, the amount of workers that are in a market. And this labor market here, really, it's a little bit complicated to just say one labor market here. This works better as a model for similar types of labor. So maybe this would be the labor of fast food cashiers for people who would be qualified to do that. You might have more specialized things like people who are brain surgeons. So you could you could pick any particular career and that would have its own supply and demand graph for labor. And the intersection of where the employers and the employees meet is the equilibrium point, just as with any supply and demand graph, and that would be the efficient wage and the efficient quantity of labor in a market, which would produce the most amount of stuff, would have the most businesses happy and the most people happy out of all the different combinations you could have. So this is what an increase in the amount of workers in an area might be. You might see this when a population is growing in an area and you have more downward pressure on labor, but also you have to think of this in terms of outsourcing. With the rise of globalization and being able to work virtually, you have a massive supply of labor compared to the past because you can just go and hire people in a different country for a drastically lower wage and that might produce a very high quality of life for them in that country because of currency exchange rates, because of just purchasing power in different countries. A lot of different factors there, that's a different story. But the fact of the matter is the supply of labor for any individual market is drastically bigger now. It's not nearly as localized as it was before in most industries. So you have a much higher downward pressure on wages because as you get more workers flooding into any sort of labor market, you're going to expect wages to go down because workers are competing with each other. That's how labor works. If you have two equally talented workers and one employer is trying to hire someone, you and they can only take on one person, that is, you're going to take the person who works for less because that's what makes sense. The person will do the same work at the same level for less. So in that way, labor is competing with the laborers are competing with each other when they're trying to get a job. And that is totally what happens. That's why you don't see just an upward slope in wages because people compete with each other. And when people compete with each other, that keeps employee costs down, which keeps product costs down. So even though wages might not rise as much, typically cost of living wouldn't rise as well. As long as you don't have other factors like, I don't know, the Fed debasing the currency and all that sort of stuff that actually happens in real life. But just looking at labor, even though wages are basically pushing each other down, you still wouldn't expect things to get more expensive because labor is a component in the things that people are making. So you wouldn't expect all the stuff that laborers might not have. I keep saying laborers. I really mean to say like workers or employees. What you have workers doing is they're making maybe the same amount as before, but because their labor cost hasn't increased, a company is also producing goods at the same cheap rate. Again, assuming you don't have other factors contributing to higher costs 
later on. My point is you don't necessarily need to see wages go up to say that this is a good economy. What you really need to see go up is purchasing power and goods are getting cheaper for people. You want relative purchasing power, not necessarily just higher wages. That doesn't really matter. What matters is what do those wages mean in the current economy? So that, that's really what you should be looking at, not just whether wages are going up because wages could be going up because of, again, the Fed printing a bunch of money and you don't have any greater purchasing power than before. You might even have less, but you, your wage is technically higher, so you got to keep that in mind. But that's really beside the main topic here, and that's that as you have more laborers in one particular market, they're going to force each other's wages down because they're competing with each other for the jobs in a particular market. So this is what you're going to see. You're going to have more labor for poor companies, and then wages will go down as people compete with each other. What about the flip side? You have more employers entering a particular area, but not necessarily more workers. So you have a shortage of labor in, in comparison, or this isn't really a shortage, but what you really have is more demanders or employers looking for the same number of employees from the same pool, that is. So you see wages go up when you have more companies competing with each other in a particular area, trying to chase the same number of laborers. So wages would go up, and again, the quantity of labor would go up too. So it's it's a win-win for workers in that sense. However, employers now have to pay more for labor, so that can make input costs more expensive. So it's not necessarily a net positive for the rest of the economy. But again, that's a much more complicated topic and depends on a ton of factors. But this is what we'd see in a labor market that has more employees employers coming into it. So now let's get the minimum wage. What would that look like? Well, you can see this purple line represents the minimum wage. The government says, all right, employers, you can't pay anyone less than this purple line here. This is our wage that we're setting for everyone. Doesn't matter. Workers, you can't work for less than this either. If you're trying to be a full-time employee, you have to work for this minimum as well. So it does cut both ways. Most people just pitch it towards employers needing to pay more, but it also means that workers can't work for less, even if that's what they want to do, because that's all that they'll get. I'm kind of leading into the next point here. And that's that look what happens to the quantity of labor supplied. You have a ton of quantity labor supplied. So people want to work for the higher wage because it's like, hey, who wouldn't? I want to make more money. But the thing is, there's less quantity of labor demanded because you don't have as many companies willing to pay that for, for labor, assuming the equilibrium point is at a different level, which in this case it is. The W1 wage one is where the market wants to be, but W2, this artificial wage set by the government, is much higher. So now all of a sudden you have businesses who don't want to demand as much labor. You have more workers who want to be working for that labor uh, wage. So it's it's totally it's totally counterproductive in that way, which is really unfortunate because the policy is meant to increase wages for workers. But what it ends up doing is it limits employers' ability to hire new workers, or maybe not even their ability, but just their desire. They're not going to want to hire someone who, who might not be able to produce at wage two here when they might be able to produce at wage one, because that's what the market would support. So this is very important to understand. And that's that labor is a market. It behaves just like many other markets. Workers compete with each other. Employers also com compete with each other in the same way, looking for talent. So those are the forces that determine what a wage should be, not some artificial government price point. And that's what happens with minimum wage. Sometimes the minimum wage might not actually do anything if it's below W1 in this case, if it's below what the actual market wages support then it might not do something for a particular class of workers. For example, you set a minimum wage of $15 an hour, but in a particular career, everyone's making 50000 per year, which is well over $15 an hour, then that doesn't really matter. That, that minimum wage doesn't affect them. But for the lower, but for the lower wage to workers that that does affect, what you're going to see is just higher unemployment. You're going to have less willing employers and perhaps even more willing employees, and that is a disconnect. That would be an un that would be an oversupply of labor and an undersupply of employers in that case, which is not a good situation to be in. So while the minimum wage really does sound nice in theory, it fundamentally ignores the fact that labor is a market, and that is a problem for laborers and employers alike. Workers are in a worse position and employers are in a worse position, except for those who might already have a job and it might protect them in a way it insulates them because they have less of a threat from people who might be willing to work for less than them. So it is a total lose-lose in that sense, besides that maybe protected class of people who are already in the door. And at a higher level perspective, remember that labor is really a global market now. And if a city, for example, sets up a minimum wage here, 
what's to stop an employer from going to some other country that doesn't have a minimum wage and hiring people virtually or simply moving their factory to another country? And that's exactly what we've seen with the rise of China, for example. China doesn't have the same sort of labor restrictions that the U.S. has, not to say that the Chinese situation is excellent, but that's the labor market in action. You have employers taking their business elsewhere to go take advantage of cheaper labor. See that with Mexico as well with the United States. You have cheaper laborers, looser labor laws. Not Again, not to say that there's no cost to that, but it is the market in action. And that's what we'd expect to happen with a labor market when minimum wages and other restrictions on labor in general are applied. So as you can probably tell, I don't think minimum wage is a very good policy. It just does not work fundamentally because it doesn't get at the root problem of actually raising wages. And that's actually fostering more businesses in an area to start competing for the same amount of labor. And that's very hard to do. But it actually is the net opposite effect in dissuading employers from hiring people. So you actually end up having more unemployment generally when you have a minimum wage installed, at least one that actually goes above what the actual market wage would support in a given industry or area. But anyways, that's all I've got for today. If you guys found this video interesting or informative, definitely leave a like since it helps the channel out a lot. And I definitely love to get your thoughts in the comments below, not only to actually talk about these issues, but also for that good old algorithm. And be sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any new updates since I put out new videos every single week as they relate to real estate, the markets, investing, all of that great stuff. And check out my book, The One Property Retirement, about a simple strategy for building your retirement nest egg using real estate. It's great for beginners who might be unfamiliar with how to actually go through with looking, buying, and maintaining a property. It goes through all of that in pretty great detail so you can get off your feet and start learning how to actually buy real estate and get your retirement nest egg going. If you guys end up buying and reading the book, definitely review on Amazon since that would help me out a lot. But until next time, take care.